Good afternoon. This is the last afternoon of the week. It's been a, a great week. We've had some very interesting presentations. The purpose of the one about to start is to be a little bit more practical about the bullion market, just to demystify it and make sure that everybody in this room fully understands the options available and the risks involved and the advantages of one over another. Before I start <clears throat> talking about bullion, I thought most relevant would be to talk a little bit about bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> and it would come in volumes, wouldn't it? No, there's, a, there's a little book here written by a professor of philosophy at Princeton, believe it or not, and it's called On Bullshit. And I, in fact, bought it at Harvard when I visited Harvard Bookstore a few years back. And it's fascinating. It's fascinating. Let me start reading uh, from the book. One of the most salient features of our culture is that there is, no, there is so much bullshit. Everyone knows this. Each of us contributes his share. But we tend to take the situation for granted. Most people are rather confident of their ability to recognize bullshit and to avoid being taken in by it. So the phenomenon has not aroused much deliberate concern, nor attracted much sustained inquiry. In consequence, we have no clear understanding of what bullshit is, why there is so much of it, or what functions it serves. And we lack a conscientiously developed appreciation of what it means to us. In other words, we have no theory. The theory of bullshit, Professor, that's what we need. I propose to begin the development of a theoretical understanding of bullshit, mainly by providing some tentative and exploratory philosophical analysis. I shall not consider the rhetorical uses and misuses of bullshit. My aim is simply to give a rough account of what bullshit is and how it differs from what it is not, putting it somewhat differently, to articulate more or less sketchily the structure of its concept. So that's, and then he goes about writing his essay. And there's a passage which I find particularly relevant in terms of understanding what we're all being the victims of today. <laughs> well, let's hope not. What we just heard today was not. <laughs> uh, in the world, outside, no, maybe not in this room, hopefully. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully there was no bullshit here this week. <laughs> so far. <laughs> I think that's about to change. <laughs> <laughs> what bullshit es essentially misrepresents is neither the state of affairs to which it refers, nor the beliefs of the speaker concerning that state of affairs. Those are what lies misrepresent by virtue of being false. See, even the subject of bullshit can start getting interesting. Since bullshit needs not be false, it differs from lies in its misrepresentational intent. The bullshitter may not deceive us or even intend to do so, either about the facts or about what he takes the facts to be. What he does necessarily attempt to deceive us about is his enterprise. His only indispensably distinctive characteristic is that in a certain way, he misrepresents what he is up to. This is the crux of the distinction between the bullshitter and the liar. Both the bullshitter and the liar represent themselves falsely as endeavoring to communicate the truth. The success of each depends upon deceiving us about that. But the fact about the bullshitter that the liar, that sorry, the fact about 
himself that the liar hides is that he is attempting to lead us away from a correct apprehension of reality. We are not to know that he wants us to believe something he supposes to be false. Does everyone follow this? The fact about himself that the bullshitter hides, however, is that the truth values of his statements are of no central interest to him. What we are not to understand is that his intention is neither to report the truth nor to conceal it. This does not mean that his speech is anarchically impulsive, but that the motive guiding and controlling it is unconcerned with how the things about which he speaks truly are. Does everybody follow this? Yep, you're talking yeah. about Ben Bernanke. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's, he's among them, he's among them. It is impossible for someone to lie unless he thinks he knows the truth. Producing bullshit requires no such conviction. <laughs> A person who lies is thereby responding to the truth, and he is, to that extent, respectful of it. <laughs> it's not a very large extent, we'll all concede. When an honest man speaks, as we've heard this week, he says only what he believes to be true. And for the liar, it is correspondingly indispensable that he considers his statements to be false. For the bullshitter, all these bets are off. He is neither on the side of the true nor on the side of the false. His eye is not on the facts at all, as the eyes of the honest man are and the liar are. His eyes are on the facts only insofar as they may be pertinent to his interest in getting away with what he says. Right? Recognize that. He does not care whether the things he says describe reality correctly. He just picks them out or makes them up to suit his purpose. Well, another philosopher was highly motivated by reading this on the subject of bullshit, and I recommend buying this book as well, although the title is a little provocative, I'd say probably more than a little. It's called Mind Fucking. But he was inspired by our bullshit. You might or might not recognize the man with the wide ears as being so, yeah. <laughs> Mr. Obama. And I, I think he's the master bullshitter of all, personally. Uh, I said that before he got elected, and I was hated uh, uh, by many, many American friends for it. That don't, don't well, talk. I, I would go so far as to say he's a liar. He always he's is. not a liar. Yeah, well, sometimes he lies. Yeah, he's, he's a liar. He, sometimes he lies, but he doesn't really care. Okay. On the subject of deception, <clears throat> I think we all here know that we have been deceived about money. As how many of you have seen the film The Prestige? None of you. Okay. It's a film uh, about a magician, and they. I didn't know until I, I saw that film that for a good magic trick, there's three stages for, for the trick. There's what's called the pledge, the turn, and the prestige. The pledge is when the magician announces what is going to be done. Well, in the monetary system, the pledge was when the Fed was created and replaced uh, dollars for Federal Reserve notes. That was the pledge that Fiat money promises will be fine. The turn, in my opinion, as I look at it, is 
when Nixon said, well, we don't need gold anymore, so therefore the dollar is as good as gold. So it turned what effectively was gold, because it was redeemable in gold, into paper money. So it's not a magic trick. What is, what is turn? You turn something into something else. Okay. So he, he's turned gold into paper, effectively, right? Yeah. Well, there could be a prestige. And what's a prestige in a magic trick? The prestige is when you, what you turned from A to B back from B to A. So the turn would be to turn paper back into gold. Would be for the dollar to go back to being fully redeemable in gold. That would be a prestige, would it not be? How many people here expect it to happen? That is one. I'd give it a non-zero probability. You know, for a magic trick to have a prestige is very rare. Most magic tricks don't go that far, right? They'll make someone disappear, but they you know, won't come back or whatever. So why do I say all this? Because I think it's very, very important. We um, made many references to John Maynard Keynes and to Nixon in 1971 and to our current um, Greenspan, Mr. Bernanke, Bernanke. I think they are all, or were in some cases, bullshitters. Because at the time, they didn't really know if it was true or not, any of those statements. But they, it certainly served their purpose. I mean, I don't know, and I mean, why would John Maynard Keynes be absolutely convinced that it was the truth that the gold standard was a barbarous relic? It certainly satisfied his purpose. And in 71, <clears throat> I think uh, President Nixon, again, probably didn't have the intention of closing the gold window forever. And he did it for a certain purpose at the time, which ended up being historically something else. And today, well, some people think that Ben Bernanke lied when he said gold is not money. I actually don't think he lied. I think he answered, not necessarily truthfully, but wearing his hat and his role. He could not say gold is money. Um, so, it's very important to keep the perception alive. And we have just three examples there that how long it can be maintained. Now I'll start talking about bullion, but <laughs> really the purpose of talking about bullion really is that you want some of your money outside of all that, outside of this unreal abnormal reality. And um, that's why we have so much deception. There are, it's, it's a war. So let's, let's, uh, let's make sure we don't get killed. And that's why we need to own bullion. Now, on Monday, uh, my presentation, I didn't need to go into the details as this group particularly understands that. But really, just to reiterate the actual in my mind, real reason, fundamental reason to own bullion is that everything else is denominated in a currency. Anything else that you trade your money to own in a portfolio, talking about an investment portfolio, is, will be in one or another currency. And it's absolutely impossible to know until we have some kind of monetary reform or some, someone step up to the plate and say that their currency is redeemable, um, where <coughs> currencies will go, ultimately. So you need to, to protect yourself from that, and the only possible way to protect yourself from that is to put some money outside that whole system, and that is to own bullion. Now, the rest of um, this session is to 
clarify what bullion means. Bullion, we just looked at before the session started, its origin, the origin of the word. I didn't know until, what, well, half an hour ago. Comes from Latin word, which translated into French for bouillon. Bouillon is a pot, and it's hot, and it's boiling. It, it, so the word comes from the process of melting, process of melting and generating pure, pure gold. That's the word anyway. But what bullion means is pure metal. That's all it means. It just means pure metal. Pure precious metal, but you could have bullion bars of um, aluminum or another metal. It, bullion is a word that is used not just for precious metals. But over here we're talking about gold, which could be silver as well, but all right. So bullion is the metal. When you buy shares in exchange-traded funds, do you own bullion? No. You, I think this group understands that quite well, although if you go into the detail of how ETFs operate, I'm not sure that everybody knows this. ETF investors have no direct relationship with the fund itself. Did you know that? Okay. And um, ETFs do not actually purchase any assets and do not receive any investment proceeds directly from investors. They rely on authorized participants, brokers or banks, to assemble and contribute baskets of the underlying securities in a gold ETF, it would be gold, presumably. Although gold is not a security, so I'm not sure how that works. And they get newly issued ETF shares in return, which they then sell to the public. So only the authorized participants have a say as market makers on uh, what baskets go into the ETF. The other thing that happens with ETFs is that they're traded, they're listed, but the, the authorized participants try and minimize the premiums only at the end of the day when the prices are published. And there's a lot of arbitrage going on during the whole day that they, they can benefit from. Now, good question to ask is, where do the market participants, or the authorized participants, or the market makers of ETFs actually get their assets, get the bullion? Anyone? Custodians and sub-custodians? Well, if you trace the history of ETFs, you find that it started with equity funds, equity and the X ETFs, um, in which brokers borrowed shares from institutions, hedge funds, mutual funds, or their client margin accounts to contribute the basket of shares needed for the ETF. So it's standard practice in the, in the industry. So you almost have to assume the same is going on with gold ETFs. Essentially, ETF, ETFs hold assets that have been borrowed. They've been borrowed by banks or other sources. The other thing, the other interesting aspect about ETFs is that the custodian typically, not all ETFs, but very typically, certainly the larger ones like GLD, um, can appoint sub-custodians, who in turn can appoint sub-sub-custodians. 
And if it's borrowed gold that never leaves the vault of the lenders, um, you know, think of the consequences. The other thing is if you're an individual investor and not a significant investor like an authorized participant or a George Soros, you cannot be redeemed in bullion. You cannot take delivery of any bullion from your investment. And there's also the possibility that if there is bullion in custody, that there is no insurance. The custodian may have insurance, but the sub-custodian may not. There is no, it's a very interesting medium of exposure to this asset that needs to be, the fine print needs to be read completely. You had, need a close review of the custodial arrangements for an ETF. Okay, so it's not ETFs. Anybody want to comment on? Can you apply that to the G, um, GLB? Because my understanding is they, non-transparent and all that sort of thing, but they own a big chunk of the bullion. They own the bullion. Is that right? Well, if you it's... say they're borrowed, the gold's borrowed and all that sort of thing. My understanding is they actually own a big chunk of it. Well, if, if, if you borrow it, you know, you own it, right? We saw that uh, yesterday. And it's whoever lent it has a, a right to be paid back. But what if the entity who lent it is one of the sub-custodians? You see? Yeah. So it's very opaque. You take a very big risk if you... Uh, yeah, so what you're saying is that can and likely does happen. They may also... Yeah. Own a chunk, borrow a chunk, futures a chunk, etc. Correct. Correct. Well, it, it, it is well known that um, who are the custodians of those vehicles, right? Or I just want to add that if you are, for any reason, ever wanting to short gold, this is a great thing to short. Ah. Because if it does collapse, it's in your favor. But anyway. It's, it's a trading vehicle. It's a good trading vehicle, it's, but it's not bullion. Right? You're not outside the system. The whole point, the whole start of this session was to um, make the point that what you want is to be outside the system. So this is completely in the system. <laughs> Has anyone in the room met GLD's performance in the US dollars against the price of gold? Oh, it tracks it very, pretty yeah, well. It tracks, oh, yeah, oh yes. It, it was, tracks. It was a 0.8% per year management fee. Right. And other than that, it tracks. Yep. At the moment. Um, but there are other kinds of funds. Uh, before I go into shares, well, I'll come back to them. I'll come back to them later. So owning bullion is owning the metal. It's not buying shares in a fund that may or may not have the bullion, but even if it does have the bullion, you don't own it. You have... Uh, you have uh, all that the, an ETF does, if you read it properly, is it promises to return the price movement of the underlying asset. It's a bit like a structured note to some extent. Um, you could have it done differently. How they actually deliver that return, hopefully, is by buying the bullion and owning it and all that. But I mean, you do not own bullion. Okay. Buying shares, buying shares in, in mining stocks or explorers or, or is that, do you own bullion? You know, you hear the expression bullion above ground and bullion underground. Do you actually own bullion underground? No. No, you don't. You own a share in the enterprise that's involved in getting it out of the ground, whether it succeed or not, profitably or not. What you have is an equity have investment. It's an investment. It may be a good investment or a bad one. It's entirely a different story. It's not actually bullion. It's not, and you're in the system. A share will be traded in, on, the, on the market. And um, I read, I think, in this document somewhere that in, in monetary uncertainty times, bullion does better than equities. 
70s is a good example. Well, bullion, the price of gold went up 24 times. Now, on average, the mining stocks went up nine times. But that doesn't mean that it's always like that, or at every seg part of the, you know, of course, in a different consequences in different periods. But when there's monetary uncertainty, bullion will, will do better and be less volatile. So bullion is actually only just the metal, the metal itself. That's what I want to make abundantly clear. We, we, we've already talked about the fact that it's not really an investment. It's not produced. You're not exchanging your money for uh, someone else to do something productive with it. You're just placing it in an inert metal, metal for the time being as a store of value. So th on this slide, I try and capture all the various types of products or means of owning gold, what's called bullion or gold investments. They're not all investments because bullion is not, but so you have three major categories, physical, what I call near physical, and paper. Physical is pretty clear, it's coins and bars. And, and there's some subsets of what kind of bars, what kind of coins, we'll, we'll see shortly, but that's pretty clear. Paper is, can be many different things. ETFs we talked about, shares is one, uh, certificates is another one, uh, options, futures, uh, uh, structured notes, um, open-ended, closed-end funds, and so forth. Where it really, I think this group will probably know this quite well, hopefully, all of you, but which is so unknown out there is this middle part. If you're not going to take delivery or if you're not going to buy bullion at the shop and dig a hole and keep it yourself or store it yourself, if you don't have the physical, then you're going to have to ha keep it stored somewhere or trust someone. This is where near physical goes. I'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. But first, just to drill down a little bit more on physical and paper. Physical, you've got all the various bullion coins that are well known and, and that you can purchase quite easily. And the bars, and, and the best, in my opinion, quality bars would be the London Good Delivery Bars. Um, numismatics can be bullion or not pure bullion, but it's, you know, it's definitely in the physical category, but I would classify that as art, a bit like art or buying stamps. You need to know what you're doing. You know, it's not, bullion is just bullion. Uh, if you have an authoritative source where you buy it from, you know, that's always very important. You want to make sure, because Forging bullion is a lot easier than forging paper money. You know, so where you buy your bullion is very important. So numismatics is, is, is something else. It's, uh, that's definitely an, uh, an investment. It's, uh, it's not money, I'd say. And then all these categories, which we can probably in the question and answer period go more into, but none of these are, are bullion. They're all investments, however. They're all investments. Bullion is not. So now we go to that more gray area that I hope everybody will be clear on, if you're not already. I, I know a number of you will already be clear on that. But I can assure you that the uh, investment professionals are absolutely unaware of this. Unaware. So there are two types of storage or accounts, if you like. The LBMA, if you go to the LBMA website, they will describe to you two types of accounts with their members, allocated, unallocated. Uh, I don't think allocated accounts is a suitable expression myself. I think if you have allocated storage or allo custody, that, that, that's more appropriate. But that means that you actually own the bar. You have title to it. You have something that proves you have title to it. Now, I don't. I know various uh, 
ways people use to to buy bullion and mo most of the time they can't show me the proof that they have title to the bullion but they're absolutely convinced they have allocated storage I, I don't understand how you can be convinced you have allocated storage to a piece of metal in someone's vault if you don't also have something that certifies